And particularly with Facebook, you know, one of the things that come up is their sharing of information with Chinese companies. that are now like Huawei, who are basically maybe government run. And you have now the US government trying to extradite the leader of Huawei from Canada while she's visiting. So you, you've got this very interesting interplay between the criminal legal system. You have Congress trying to figure out what to do and ultimately actually can come back to a constitutional issue, a First Amendment issue. Podcast. I'm your host, Trent Lipinski. In this episode, I interview Vinu Varaghese. He is a criminal defense attorney and a former prosecutor. You may recognize him from CNN, CBS, and he was just on Wolf Blitzer. In this episode, we discuss the war on drugs, cannabis legalization, as well as big tech and data breaches. Plus, we dive into Julian Assange and the whole Chelsea Manning situation and what just happened with Assange's arrest and WikiLeaks. This is an amazing episode. We don't get a lawyer on the show that often, so please stay tuned. This episode of Hacker Noon is sponsored by DigitalOcean. Join a community of over 3.5 million developers learning how to build and scale high-performance web apps on the simplest cloud platform. With a flat pay-as-you-go pricing structure and monthly caps across all global data centers, DigitalOcean makes it easy to get the computer resources you need without the billing surprises you get from other cloud providers. Discover why developers love DigitalOcean and get started with a free $100 credit at do.co slash hackernoon. Full stack developer Austin Pocus. We're using it to host a discourse site. So basically they give us a machine and we run a dockerized instance of discourse on there. Gets a few clicks and discourse is ready to rock. With DigitalOcean, they have a marketplace where you just click, I want discourse. You provision a droplet and you're good to go. Welcome to the podcast. I'm here with Vanu. Tell us a bit about who you are and what you've been working on. So Trent, I'm a criminal defense attorney, and I'm also a, a talking head. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm on television regularly uh, talking about criminal legal issues or all different types of legal issues, but mostly criminal stuff. I comment on CNN. Uh, I was actually on Wolf Blitzer's show last night um, at the time of recording it, which is now April 11th, right? So I was on yesterday. Uh, I comment for CBS, uh, MSNBC, uh, headline news. Uh, I've been on Israeli TV, Turkish TV, Canadian TV. But that that's my uh, hobby. You know, my day job is that I'm a criminal defense attorney. Most of our work is white collar work, financial fraud work. We're in federal courts all across the country. I have investigations right now in, in California um, and not where you are in the Bay Area, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. I, have, I have a big investigation uh, right there being prosecuted by the U.S. Attorney's Office or investigated by the U.S. Attorney's Office that covers your, uh, your neck of the woods. And so, you're a uh, former prosecutor, right? Correct, correct. I started out uh, right out of law school. I was a state prosecutor uh, in New York in the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, and I prosecuted a, a bunch of uh, – uh, all different types of stuff, but a lot of the work when you're a state prosecutor is drug work. So I was a, a I did a lot of drug prosecutions. Um, so uh, you know I've spoken a lot. I was I left the office in 2006, um, and I've been doing private criminal defense ever since then. And you know I, I defend people who are charged with with drug crimes. Uh, but initially I, I was an agent of the, of the war on drugs and now I'm, you know, or for the last 15 years I've been speaking out against it. And uh, that's, you know, one of the things where we met, you know, I spoke to you uh, about yeah. that. So we met uh, at the international cannabis business conference here in San Francisco a couple months ago. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed your presentation. You, uh, you know, I, it was very interesting because you had a slide where you were talking about the classification of different drugs. And, you know, we hear about these things in conversation on, and conversationally, but just to actually like see and read the law, I mean, it just, for me, it made no sense. I'm just like seeing cannabis and herb, you know, slapped in there with like some pretty heavy duty drugs. Um, and I'm just like, wait, like one of these things is not the same. <laughs> um, so can you talk a little bit about, you know, that 
drug classification system and the war on drugs and how you ended up kind of on one end of the spectrum and now you're on the other? So absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I, that I brought in when I spoke at that presentation, I had, we had a PowerPoint and I talked about the drug classification. Now the drug classification is set, set out by the uh, DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency. So I was pulling it up on my secondary screen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you what, mm -hmm. uh, what this means. So a Schedule One drug is something that's Schedule One are drugs, substances, or chemicals that are defined as drugs with no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. Some examples, and this is right from the DEA website, which is a slide that I had up at the mm -hmm. conference, are heroin, LSD, uh, meth, uh, they put in parentheses ecstasy, uh, and uh, peyote is actually on there. But the, the drug that uh, jumps out at, that should jumps, jump out at everyone is that marijuana, cannabis, is a Schedule One drug. So to put this in context, let's look at Schedule Two drugs. Schedule two drugs, substances, or chemicals are defined as drugs with a high potential for abuse, with use potentially leading to severe psychological or physical dependence. These drugs are also considered dangerous. Some examples of schedule two drugs are uh, hydrocodone, uh, Vicodin, cocaine, meth, methadone, <laughs> uh, hydromorphone, oxycodone, uh, and they put in parentheses oxycontin, Fentanyl, Adderall, and Ritalin. Yeah. So what it jumps out is marijuana still to this day is a Schedule One drug, but yeah. the, uh, but you know considered w with a high potential for abuse, with potentially leading to severe psychological physical dependence. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading Schedule Two. No currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. Mm -hmm. That's which, what marijuana is, is classified as by the DEA. Which I know you're not a doctor, but there's medical research on things like ecstasy, cannabis, even LSD for having therapeutic uses. I mean, they've talked about using MDMA for, uh, for veterans who are dealing with PTSD. Um, cannabis, of course, has pain relieving anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, you know, CBD it isn't even psychoactive. Um, which actually has been legalized uh, due to the Trump administration. They actually passed it in a farm bill that, uh, you know, that is now federally legalized. And was it rescheduled? Do you know what happened with CBD there? Uh, you know, on that, um, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, okay. I knew that I was in the farm you, bill. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what I can tell you is that there has been no, uh, I think there are groups like some of the groups that spoke at the conference we were at trying mm -hmm. to do something about this. But the reality is there doesn't seem to be any major, there's nothing brewing right now in Congress to try to get marijuana off that schedule one. And, and what's happening is that, you know, I see it, I've represented people um, charged with, you know, marijuana importation. And, and uh, you know, I had a client who was uh, involved in money laundering with the Sinaloa cartel. Uh, recently, I had, I had covered the El Chapo trial for CBS. And uh, I was regularly commenting uh, at least once a week, sometimes twice a week on the trial. And I spoke about that having, you know, represented somebody involved with the, with the cartel. Well, I'm really on a more of a money laundering basis. But uh, the... You know, with those things, uh, it, it's it's astounding to me that marijuana is considered by the DEA and Congress, for that matter, to be no currently accepted medical use and a high potential of abuse, particularly when you have states. And, and we had put this little um, uh, pamphlet together at the conference, and we, we did a 50-state uh, thing to show where it's, you know, the different level of uh, points of where, where marijuana is legalized. And so you have it, you know, legal in adults and, and medical for medical use in a majority of states and a lot of a number of other states, it's been decriminalized. Mm -hmm. Almost all the states are, are legal. The only two places where it's illegal are Idaho and South Dakota. Yeah. <laughs> completely illegal. And I think Don't some of those states use. are, and I know there's several states that have like pending laws that are going to go uh, on the books soon, like in coming years, right. they're planning medical or different uh, classifications. I think uh, Utah is one of them. 
I think they haven't done their medical system yet, but it's planned to go into effect at a certain point in the future. So, I mean, the well, fact- one, of the, one of the things uh, if, then is that I, I forgot to mention, I'm in New York. I'm yeah. in and I, my office, which you're looking at, is here on Wall Street. And this is the back of, you know, that's that's my office. I'm at two Wall Street. And um, New York, new budget, Governor Cuomo, who had talked about potentially moving to legalize, and the new budget did not, or the new bills that he put forth, did not call for the uh, legalization of mm -hmm. uh, marijuana completely. It's not in the new budget, even though there's talk that it would be. This episode of Hacker Noon is sponsored by DigitalOcean. Join a community of over 3.5 million developers learning how to build and scale high-performance web apps on the simplest cloud platform. With a flat pay-as-you-go pricing structure and monthly caps across all global data centers, DigitalOcean makes it easy to get the computer resources you need without the billing surprises you get from other cloud providers. Discover why developers love DigitalOcean and get started with a free $100 credit at do.co slash hackernoon. Full stack developer Austin Pocus. We're using it to host a discourse site. So basically they give us a machine and we run a dockerized instance of discourse on there. Gets a few clicks and discourse is ready to rock. With DigitalOcean, they have a marketplace where you just click, I want discourse. You provision a droplet and you're good to go. But I understand CBD is actually still sold in New York, even though it's kind of a gray area right now. Yeah, any... it's, it's a oh, weird thing. Um, I, I think that, so there, there was a conflict recently, this was highlighted by some of the local papers here, that um, there seems to be, like in New York City, both the Brooklyn and the Manhattan District Attorney's Office have basically said that they are not going to prosecute simple possession cases of marijuana. Mm -hmm. But they are still prosecuting CBD uh, possession cases. It's a little weird, uh, and they haven't really figured this out yet. So, Yeah, I mean, the drug issue, I mean, it's so complicated because, as you were saying earlier, you know, when it comes to, like, some of these drug organizations, it's more about the money laundering and the potential crimes that take place because it's illegal um, that actually causes probably more crime and more issues to take place. Whereas when you have a decriminalized system or a legalized system, you know, now you've got the regulatory frameworks in place so that it gets rid of the gray or black markets so that the crimes that happen around those markets actually reduce or even completely go away. I, I, I would think so. And then particularly with marijuana, I mean, the big issue in New York is, and they haven't figured this out yet, uh, there's been a lot of discussions of, of, you know, allowing companies to come in, right? California has already has, you know, has done this for a while. And, and, you know, you have all these companies and you have cannabis lawyers to assist these companies and setting them up and, and all that stuff. But in New York, there's been a, um, a, a debate and they haven't figured it out yet. Um, between, okay, you're opening up the markets to New York, you're going to have this available or, or open ultimately, it's going to happen. It's a question of when. And, you know, are you going to allow other, you know, companies to come in and, and there's been talk that you have to, um, like the government wants to run this. Yeah. And, and, and the reason is to, to um, give back to the communities that were devastated by the drug war. It's a nice idea in theory, right? So like, okay, you know, it's the, it the poor, you know, inner city communities that were devastated by the war on drugs. But, you know, I'm leery of government running things. And, and I think ultimately, um, you know, having worked for the government, you know, my views are, 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 are very skeptical of the government. And uh, I, I just think that, you know, that's not going to work and you have to allow for, private companies to come in and that's how, you know, you're going to further decriminalize the, you know, uh, or re reduce or hopefully eliminate the criminal element here. And, and once New York figures this out, I mean, that's probably the largest metropolitan area in the country. So once New York has that kind of figured out, that could also be the potential framework that then helps federally figure this out. Um, because once New York goes, uh, you know, kind of so does the rest of the country. That's typically how a lot of these situations play out. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what New York's next move is because we've kind of figured things out in California. Like I wouldn't say the, I wouldn't say legal cannabis went well. I mean, it's definitely regulated cannabis um, and they're still figuring out the tax issues and 
the incentives and there's still a gray market and there's still some things that are happening uh, that, you know, are going to take some time and some careful consideration and they're going to have to adjust the laws here and there. But for the most part, it's working. Um, you know, there's, you know, it's not, uh, it's not feeding that kind of prison industrial complex like it used to. You know, they're taking some people out of jail who have just drug offenses. Um, you know, certain things are starting to take place now where, you know, we're starting to head in the right direction. So, you know, what's going to happen next in New York? Uh, I can't say, but, uh, you know, I think once New York figures it out, hopefully that will also then provide a framework federally. I hope so, too. I mean, because the feds are really behind on this stuff. And, uh, you know, they're behind uh, most states. I mean, New York, uh, you know, on, on criminal issues was actually not is not very progressive. And there was just ma major criminal justice reform here and done in New York. That's for greater accountability for prosecutors. I mean, the, the Prosecutors Association here in New York, the District Attorneys Association, has been a powerful lobbying force in state government and has prevented the implementation of a watchdog group on prosecutors. And Cuomo, to his credit, I'm not a big fan of his, but uh, to his credit, was actually able to get that passed. And the DAs are going to be looking to challenge it. Um, and, and it called for greater transparency, whereas you know states like California and, and most states have actually greater transparency in, in the release of information that the prosecutor has, right? Mm -hmm. So the criminal case versus the civil case, you have in a civil case, if you go to trial, you know what the other side has and you've known it for a long time. And what's at stake in a civil case? Money, right? It's mm -hmm. when you're looking at somebody going to jail potentially for the rest of their life in the federal system and in New York up until like, couple of weeks ago, right? The prosecutors can get to hide everything until the last minute. So there are some discovery rules and some people will take ink as well. You know, there's there are certain things that they're required to remember. Yes, but when you're as a criminal attorney, criminal defense attorney, you want to know like what the government has written down. You want to know witness reports, witness statements. And in both the federal system and in New York until extremely recently, the prosecution can hide that stuff until the end. Well, and you're fighting for people's freedom. This is not money here necessarily we're talking about. This is Correct. actual people's lives uh, and, you know, potentially preventing them from going to jail for a plant. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty serious issue. Um, this is not uh, the same as, you know, some of these financial cases. Anyways, I would love to kind of pivot the conversation to the tech industry since, you know, this is the Hacker Noon podcast. So I'd love to get your thoughts on some of the stuff we've seen. You know, you've had a lot of people in the tech industry, the CEOs of major tech companies, Twitter, Facebook, you know, go in front of Congress recently. We've had so many data breaches. I've lost track of them. Um, do you have any thoughts on what's kind of happening in Silicon Valley and the tech industry in general? Well, uh, two different things, right? I mean, uh, with the, uh, you know, data breaches, or, you know, one issue, that's obviously internal security, right? So the, the issue with these people going in front of Congress is actually really interesting. Over the last, you know, six months, you've had um, Zuckerberg testify, you've had um, you know, people from Twitter. So the interesting thing is when they had these hearings uh, in the fall, um, last fall, uh, Google didn't show up, right? <laughs> and and then they later showed up. Yeah. Um, and you know they're talking about what they can do to prevent. Um, earlier in the summer, with Mark Zuckerberg, you know, preventing the dissemination of, of fake news and and uh, what they're going to do. And, and you know, it seems like Facebook is having a really tough time. They're mm -hmm. trying, but they're a really tough time to crack down on these. Uh, fake news sources. And as we learned from uh, even before the Mueller report, intelligence agencies have confirmed that there was, um, you know, Russian, you know, uh, control troll farms that info that affected and, and put out uh, fake news during the 2016 election. So well, there was Cambridge Analytica and that whole scandal yeah. as well. So Facebook actually sold some of the data um, right. that resulted in some of this, um, which is even more crazy. Um, and you've got, I mean, yeah, I mean, Facebook, and then Facebook did change their algorithm. So I did a whole episode on this uh, with Christina Warren 
she worked for Mashable and Gizmodo, and uh, she now is at Microsoft. But uh, we did a whole episode for an hour talking about the journalism apocalypse because Facebook turned off all news. Um, that was their solution. They just turned it all off. So that has led to like massive layoffs at BuzzFeed and a lot of these major uh, online publications because Facebook is no longer disseminating any news articles from any news organization because they couldn't figure out how to pick the bad ones from the good ones. So they just kind of turned them all off. So that literally affected the bottom line of some of these companies. Yeah. And, and particularly with them, um, you know, one of the things that had come up is their, uh, their sharing of information with Chinese companies, right? Mm-hmm. It's companies that are now like Huawei, who are basically maybe government run and, uh, or are government run involved in, yeah. and, and you have now the, uh, the U.S. government trying to extradite the, the leader of Huawei from, from, from Canada while she's visiting. And so you, you've got this very interesting um, interplay between uh, the criminal legal system Mm-hmm. And you have the you know Congress trying to figure out what to do, and ultimately this actually can come back to a constitutional issue, a First Amendment issue, right? I mean, to the extent that Facebook and, and you know Facebook is not a government actor, right? And Google is not a government actor. They're not. They don't work for the government. They're not an arm of the government. So the question is, how much can Congress really regulate them mm-hmm. to crack down on fake news and things like that? And to the extent, how much is this? Uh, suppression of free speech. So it's a really tough uh, line and balancing act that both the government, you know, the United States government, Congress, whatever, it has to has to um, have with these companies that, you know, are what are you doing? Are they, okay, that there's some public, there's obviously, there's a public interest in, in protecting against um, f- you know, fraud, right? But at the same time, how much of that is, you know, are you going to trample on First Amendment rights? Yep. No, absolutely. And the, the crazy thing is, is there is actually, I don't know what other word to use, collusion between these the government and these companies. I mean, Amazon had a, like, I think half a billion dollar contract uh, with the CIA to be able to do data processing for the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, so you've got government contracts between Google and the US government, military industrial contracts. Um, you've got a lot of contracts between these companies and there is data and computing power being shared between the US government and these tech companies. So they, although they are not government actors, in some cases they are when they are being contracted by the US government. And that just opens a whole other, like, you know, a whole other, I, I don't know, a whole other basket of legal issues because, you know, they're acting both as private companies, but also taking government contracts and we don't know what's happening with the data. We don't know what's happening with a lot of these situations. And then that data keeps getting leaked and we keep having these data breaches. Yeah. You know, one of the companies actually that you have to give uh, uh, a lot of credit to uh, is Microsoft, Mm -hmm. which uh, they actually were, uh, went to the Supreme court to try to block a search warrant uh, of their servers, which were located in Ireland. And ultimately then there was a, they were fighting the U.S. government. And I was actually very impressed. You know, yeah. they were taking this position that it was, and it was very, ended up being a very technical uh, position Then Congress amended the law to, and, and it made the argument moot. And so there was a change in the law that, that basically, you know, it's, it's really in the weeds here, but ultimately, um, let me do this. The light just went out. So let me, yeah. Go ahead and turn that back on. How is the lighting on my end, by the way? It's because I just- Great until the lights turned off. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so you were, you're talking Microsoft, so maybe restate uh, your Microsoft uh, statement there. Sure. So Microsoft had gone and, and to war with the U.S. government over the uh, the government had sought in a criminal case in New York to um, uh, compel Microsoft to turn over uh, you know server information, email data 
from but their servers were located in Ireland. The question was, could the U.S. government can you know compel an American company who puts its servers abroad um, to do that? And they said no under the old law. But then, while the appeal was pending to the before the U.S. Supreme Court, Congress changed the law, and ultimately, the the issue became moot. So, yeah. but uh, compared to other companies such as Google, which you know, as you were saying, uh, uh, you mentioned Amazon, but Google and other companies, I mean, there's almost, it almost seems that there's no difference between the United States government and Google. Yeah. <laughs> and whereas a company like Microsoft was taking a, a, a stronger position, Apple, you know, also took a position uh, when it didn't release uh, data on how to hack its iPhone. Um, and that caused some controversy because that involved a terrorist attack in, in California. Um, but, you know, they, they, I think they took the right position, but they were criticized by, you know, people who are uber pro law enforcement and, you know, people that are uber pro law enforcement don't understand that, you know, you're really whittling away on individual protections. And that's what our country was founded on, right? Protections of the individual. And, uh, you know, you have to applaud, you know, when an Apple or Microsoft takes a stand like they do. And as a lawyer, do you have a concern with the law's ability to stay up to date with like modern technology and what's happening? Because, I mean, I, you know, I interview a lot of people in the blockchain space, smart contracts, like as a consultant, I have another project where I'm building an automation platform. I mean, we're at a point now where there's artificial intelligence, there's you know, smart contracting, there's blockchains handling financial transactions outside the banking sector. I mean, there's so much happening right now on on the technological front and it's just going faster and faster and faster. Can the legal system and the judiciary system keep up? This this has been a constant struggle um, in, in the law because the law usually takes a long time to catch up to this stuff. So a lot of the, the advancement of the law is actually happening on, you know, the commercial level where there's suits, right? But, you know, in terms of like, you know, this, this, is, this is an issue right now, technology with um, GPS tracking and, and things along those lines that the, that the courts have struggled with and, and trying to put together a, a Fourth Amendment analysis, you know, which is the right to be free from an unlawful search and seizure has proven difficult, right? So if prosecutors have their way, um, everyone, you, at me, everyone, all their information would be available to the, uh, to the government at, at a whim, right? And so it's these prosecuting agencies and people, see always they, they look at prosecutors as, you know, the good guys, right? You know, it's that law and order stuff like really has, has seeped into pop culture that these guys are doing, they're doing God's work, right? And these are the people, and, and it's funny that people ask me, let me take a personal level, they ask me like, you know, oh, you know, what do you like more, being a criminal defense attorney or a prosecutor? I was like, serious? Like, you're asking me, you're really asking me these questions? I tell people, you couldn't pay me all the money in the world to be a prosecutor again. Because knowing what I've, what I, what I knew, seeing what I've seen, it's just the amount of people that, you know, often prosecutors, they get drunk with power, right? Mm-hmm. So why do people like, you know, if you're a prosecutor, you're not getting, you know, it's not a high paying job. I mean, it's decent pay when you get, when you're there for a while, right? So, but it's power, right? Power is the greatest, you know, aphrodisiac, you know, the greatest stimulant for a lot of these people. And that's why they become prosecutors. And, and there are, look, I don't want to say all prosecutors. I know a lot of good ones. I was a good one. And, and, you know, it, it's, um, I think a lot of people who take their job seriously and want to administer ju- uh, justice fairly, but then there's a lot of people who were like, you know, take these positions of, you know, oh, well, you know, we're not going to do anything. Well, what will we do with that data, right? It would just if you if you're not a criminal, you've got it, you've got nothing to worry about. I'm sorry, I don't want to leave that for you to judge. You know? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean personally. Criminal. Personally, I think I think we almost need like another Bill of Rights to protect privacy and data. Um, that, you know, puts privacy and data online because we're almost dealing with two worlds here. We've got the real world and we've got the digital world. In the real world, we've got a constitution and we have laws and we have all these rights. But in the digital world, we have nothing. We're relying on case law as it comes. There's no like, 
you know, there's nothing that says like, hey, I've got a right to privacy online. I mean, you can argue the real world laws affect the online world, but it's difficult um, and complex because they're, they're really two different realms. Uh, they're almost two different dimensions. It's, it's, a, it's a very unique time in human history to have this dilemma that's taking place. And there has been some movement, though. I mean, I will tell you that over the last couple of years, there's been very positive uh, decisions that have come out of the U.S. Supreme Court, a conservative court uh, with um, conservative uh, justices like John Roberts ruling in favor of greater privacy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that, that you need a warrant before you can uh, put a GPS tracker under somebody's car, right? Mm-hmm. And that, that U.S. Supreme Court said that. So, you know, you wouldn't have expected. So there is movement, and it's actually interesting. It's the people that are, that are more libertarian mm-hmm. um, that, that understand these things. And, and, and often libertarians are not necessarily Republicans. Or Republicans are not necessarily libertarians. But, you know, there seems to be more people that are sort of, um, you know, in the sort of conservative, true conservatives, I'm not talking today's conservatives, right? Uh, you know, the current political climate. It's about liberty. Who very, about who are skeptical of government intervention. Mm-hmm. Justice uh, Gorsuch has been, you know, before he uh, was elevated to the U.S. Supreme Court bench, has given talks about, you know, the power of the prosecutor and that in our society it's important to keep prosecutors in check. I was like, wow, music to my ears, you know, and uh, people don't appreciate that enough. And so I think the law is catching up because believe it or not, I I, I think those, the analysis, as long as you stick to our constitution, stick to our bill of rights, and you put that in that context, it's just that it's going to take a while, right? Mm -hmm. Because all these issues and as as data develops, um, you know, the issue that, I mean, there are people, prosecutors take the position, well, you signed away. You consented by using a cell phone. You've consented to monitoring, right? Yeah. There are prosecutors who take that position. I know. It's kind of crazy. Um, you know, we live in trying times. Uh, you know, I'd love to ask you a little bit about something that actually just happened today when we just before we were recording this is Julian Assange got arrested. Uh, yeah. You know, there, and then we also had Chelsea Manning arrested again for refusing to testify against Assange, potentially knowing that Assange was potentially going to be handed over to the UK authorities. Uh, What are your thoughts? Is Julian Assange going to get extradited to the US? Is is this going to go to court? What's this, what's, what's about to happen here? So uh, if I can, Trent, uh, can I share my screen with you? Uh, Good. Or if you want to just read it, maybe. Yeah, I I was going to share. I pulled the indictment that was released and uh, it, it looks, uh, you know, and the reason, so your question of, is he going to get extradited? The answer is going to be yes, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> is, is the British government is certainly going to give him to the United States government. It's just, it's, it's going to happen. They wouldn't have unsealed this indictment um, yeah. if that weren't going to happen because there has to be a formal indictment in order for the State Department to make the extradition request. And, and and file that with the with the government of the you know in the United Kingdom. And so they have um, their hand by by going after Chelsea Manning and trying to get her to ch- testify uh, against Assange. Why do that if you're not going to be prosecuting Assange? Right, and and here's so the same. Um, you know, so she's being held uh, for civil contempt, mm-hmm. right? So because she's already been found guilty, right? She was found guilty, and she, her sentence was commuted by President Obama, right? That was one of his last acts. But so she has no Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination because she can't incriminate herself. But by refusing to testify, she's being held in civil contempt mm-hmm. for not cooperating with the judge because she has no she – can't, she can't plead the Fifth. Yeah. <laughs> there's no Fifth for her. She's already been found guilty. So. Yeah. That's crazy. So back to Assange, uh, you know, what is there a legal precedent here for, you know, I I mean, personally, I make the argument that he's a journalist. I mean, did he take, you know, potentially leaked and or stolen files? Yes. I mean, I think we've concluded due to the Mueller report that the Russian collusion narrative is kind of not what we thought it was. Um, And it's now potentially likely that 
you know, WikiLeaks may have gotten the DNC files that during the 2016 election from an inside source. Um, you know, I personally reviewed the the data on how that you know what went down there. There is evidence that uh, it was a thumb drive that was plugged into a DNC computer, and that was the source of the leak. Um, and it wasn't a traditional hack in the sense that you know someone who is remotely outside the network got access to the network. It was more likely that someone physically had access to it. So we obviously don't know. This is speculation. Um, right. What the details are there, but uh, you know, is there a legal precedent for you know a journalist or a journalism organization to release leaked files? And you know, will he have the same protections as a journalist, or is he considered not a journalist? So the interesting thing, I'm looking at the indictment, and and um, uh, before I get to that question, I want to address something you just said yeah. about the Mueller report. <laughs> let's let's be clear here, and people are jumping at this Mueller report still hasn't been released to Congress. Right. There has been a summary put forth by the attorney general who, at the time of our filming of this, as the previous two days had testified before Congress. And Bob Mueller, the prosecutor, did not find evidence sufficient to warrant prosecution. Mm -hmm. The idea of, of collusion of individuals of the Trump campaign colluding with the Russian government. Right. That just means that there wasn't enough proof from his perspective to bring a case. The obstruction charges, as he said, that he was not exonerated. Yeah. Debar made the decision to exonerate him. So this is long, you know, far from over, and it's going to be developed. And the narrative may not be anywhere near what President Trump has said in terms of total incarceration once this gets to Congress. Now, getting back to Assange in terms of precedent and all this other stuff, I'm, I'm going to read you what it says here uh, in the indictment. And this is out of the Eastern District of Virginia, which is considered one of the top prosecutorial, which is Northern Virginia. It's kind of the, one of the top prosecutor's offices in the country. It's where Paul Manafort was recently prosecuted. Um, paragraph five of the indictment says, Assange, when it talked about um, him being the founder and leader of the WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks website published publicly solicited submiss submissions of classified, censored, and other restricted information. Assange, who did not possess a security clearance or need to know, was not authorized to receive classified information of the United States. So the charge is conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. That's what they've charged him with. And this is just an initial charging document. I imagine there's going to be more charges against him. They're going to supersede this, um, this indictment uh, against him or the uh, and, and they'll add more charges depending on you know, when he gets over. Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, there, there's stuff about uh, here in this about Manning and Assange discussed the value of the Guantanamo Bay detainee assessment briefs mm -hmm. uh, before entering the password cracking uh, agreement. And uh, it's, it's there's a lot of stuff in here. Well, there's two um, issues because there's the there's the Chelsea Manning situation. Right. So there's the information that Chelsea gave to WikiLeaks that you know, basically revealed a lot of information about the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Um, and that revealed a bunch of cables and a bunch of private and classified communications and all kinds of classified, you know, information about wars that were taking place. So that's one issue. Then the second more recent issue was what happened during the 2016 election with John Podesta's emails, the right. DNC emails. Um, and I mean, that probably had a direct impact on the 2016 election and potentially did help Trump get elected because a lot of that content from those leaks, you know, it, I mean, it, it made a, it made a pretty unique, it, it painted a very unique picture of the inside of a political campaign that we've never had insight to before. So I personally read through a lot of the files um, because I got to look inside a presidential campaign, like, that's a window that I wanted to peep into. Um, you know, you will probably never get to see what that looks like before. Or, or we, I'm sorry, we've never seen what that looks like before, and we'll probably never get to see something like this again in you know U.S. political history. Right. Um, so it was fascinating because you know it did talk about a lot of different things. I mean, potentially the Bernie Sanders 
uh, issue of, you know, was he the real nominee? Did Hillary Clinton, you know, sway the Democrats and superdelegates and manipulate that system? Like, there's some real controversy here. There were some real things that, you know, were revealed that probably had an impact on the way that some people voted. So that's the second most recent issue. Uh, but I think probably a lot of the charges that are going to be brought against Assange are going to be for the Chelsea Manning issue and the first issue, which was, you know, the leaking of classified information regarding wars in, uh, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan. So right now, as of now, as of the moment that we're filming this mm-hmm. on April 11th, uh, 2019, the the only thing that's been released to the public is that com, uh, computer hacking conspiracy with Chelsea Manning. So the, it does not appear as of yet there are charges related to the 2016 election against Julian Assange. Now that could change. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Once he's brought over, and I I wonder if there is some connection to all of this and the Mueller report. Um, because there could be, since we haven't been able to read it, at least at the time of when uh, this is being recorded. So, you know, like I said, the fact that Chelsea Manning was arrested and, you know, they were trying to get her to testify, uh, you know, a month or so ago, tells us that they were, you know, the prosecutors were potentially knew that they were going to be prosecuting Assange at some point in the near future. So it sounds like this has all been in motion for a while. Yeah, and I'll tell you this about the Mueller report. You're not going to know the answer to, to that question because <laughs> yeah. that's if it's an ongoing investigation, that is definitely not getting to Congress. Yeah, and I, I could definitely see that as well. Well, we've covered a lot of ground here so far. We're on the Hacker Noon podcast. So I've got to ask you sometime in your life that you've had to hack something. Well, I, I, I had to hack uh, the the uh, New York district attorney's office. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't hack into their system uh, as in the traditional definition of hack, but I had a situation back in 2013 uh, where I was defending a client and it was a press case. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there was a lot of press about this case. And ultimately the DA's office took a position uh, where they wanted to get me off this case. And it was actually the biggest compliment that they could have paid me. But what they did was manufacture a conflict between my client and me because they called me to testify. They sent me a grand jury subpoena to testify against a witness who had provided information to the district attorney's office against my client. And so if you just follow along here, this is, this gets a little complicated, but so I'm, there is no privilege between me and that witness. Ultimately, that witness who testified for the DA was providing helpful information to us. Mm -hmm. And so the question was at the time is they called me and they were like, oh, we'd like to talk to you about your conversations with with uh, Marina. Right. And uh, and I said, well, I'm not confirming nor denying whether I had any conversations with Marina. Well, would you accept a grand jury uh, subpoena by email? I said, you can serve me any way you like. Service isn't going to be the issue. You know, I'll save you the trip of having one of your you know, detectives come over to my office and hand, hand it to me. Um, and I accepted it by subpoena. And then I was like, these people are crazy. Because ultimately, in terms of, I have an investigation to conduct on my own to protect my client. How, you know, what I, who I speak to is none of their business. Imagine that, you know, me asking them, hey, tell me who all the witnesses are right now. And we're not at trial. It's a different thing when you're at trial, right? When you have to reveal that, you got to give witness lists, but investigations are secret. Right? Mm-hmm. So how I conducted my investigation was none of their business. So they wanted to know about conversations I had with this witness. Well, I could neither confirm nor deny. And ultimately what we did was I, it was such a unique situation. I went to the newspapers and the New York Law Journal started covering it. And they put my put me on the front cover of the New York Law Journal like five times. And, and ultimately it, it became this issue of, really infringing upon my client's rights to have me represent him. And so the National Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys, which is a nonprofit national group that does a lot of policy work, came in and represented me pro bono because they they found the subpoena to be such an infringement, such a deliberate interference into my relationship with my client. Because ultimately, had I testified and provided information about my conversations with this witness, while not the subject of what I discussed with my own client, this would have adversely affected 
my client. Yeah. Right? Cause I'm conducting an investigation or at least that's what they thought. Right. And, and you know what they, what I, what was said between a witness and I ultimately would have been negative for my client and ultimately would have required me to get off the case. So, because I could no longer represent them. And that's what they intended. And yeah. so the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and then the Legal Aid Society here in New York came in as what they called an amicus in support of this. And they moved to quash the subpoena. And ultimately the DA withdrew it because they got, they looked really bad. Yeah. So ultimately you use the media in a way to kind of hack that situation, to bring light to the situation, to kind of rally reinforcements. If it weren't for that, then, you know, it, it would have been a lot harder. And I think that this could have been litigated more. That the media and, and having a group like the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers that is really committed to protecting, you know, the, the right to counsel and an individual's right to have the lawyer of his choice. So we've covered a lot of ground here from drug laws to data breaches to tech industry being called in front of Congress to Julian Assange. Do you have any final thoughts before we wrap up? I would just say in any situation, and I'm uh, the biggest cheerleaders, question the government, question <laughs> the actions. Don't take things at face value because there's a lot of, of, of you know, assumptions. Don't assume if somebody has been arrested that they're automatically guilty, no matter what kind of you know, charge it is. I mean, that's, that's I'm being American, yeah. right? Yeah. Criticizing is being American, and that's what makes this country great. Absolutely. Well, where can people find you? So um, uh, you can find me online at vargislaw.com. That's V-A-R-G-H-E-S-E-L-A-W.com. Just Google me. I'm kind of all over the place. You know, it's, uh, yeah. you know, on, You're uh, on CNN, uh, CBS, uh, you know, name any of the major mainstream media news. I'm, I'm, I'm there. I've been, <laughs> I've been on all of them and I'm on them regularly. So. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on the show and talking about all these topics. This has been an amazing episode. My pleasure, Trent. Thanks a lot. This concludes.